I want to thank you all for coming out for the talk so about growing pecans in Ohio. And I have started growing pecan trees, and when I tell people that I'm growing pecans, the first thing they tell me is, I didn't know you could grow pecans in Ohio. And I tell people, well, why not? Because pecans grow wild in Ohio. And they'll give me a deer in the headlights look. But if you look at the pecan distribution map, you can see right there by Cincinnati's a little red dot. <laughs> and there is a stand of wild pecans down there. The, there was one, the, if you ever look up, the Goshen cultivar. It was from a tree that was found in that little plant. Now, are you guys familiar with this map? It's the new USDA plant hardiness zone map. And that's what people normally look at whenever they look at what plant they're going to grow. Can you guys see any similarity between those two maps? Growing zones. For Ohio, it's the same as what. But when you look at where pecans grow versus that map, there's nothing in common. Because this map is looking at totally different things than the limiting factors for pecans. That looks at the average low temperature at, during winter over the past 30 years. Pecans can handle cold temperatures. Ernie Grimo's growing them up in Canada, up in Ontario. You can see they're all the way to the top part of Illinois that still grow naturally. Now if you look at this map, this is a precipitation map, and you can see that the western border of that and northern follows the precipitation map. So water is very important how much water you get. There's a couple things we need to look at. Different pecan varieties require different amounts of chilling hours in the wintertime. They range from three to eight hundred hours. Ohio, we're good on that. We actually have winter. They also require at least eight hundred of what they call chilling or cooling degree days. What that is, I don't know how they came up with it, but for a temperature above sixty-five degrees, when you would need cooling like air conditioning. If it gets up to 70 degrees one day, that's 5 degrees over 65, so they would consider that 5 cooling degree days. If it's 80 degrees, that's 15 cooling degree days. <clears throat> Ohio ranges normally 1,000 to 1,200 on those, so we're good on that. Pecans really like about 4 foot of precipitation a year. We only get 40 inches. 39 to 41 is what it's been running. So the pecans would like more water, but they can manage with that. <clears throat> On the precipitation map, when you compare it to the distribution, when you get areas below 40 inches of rain a year, you don't have pecans growing. Another limiting factor that limits us, we need 180 frost-free days for the nut to develop. And most of Ohio is running 170 to 210. But that's today. It'll be 10 years before you start producing, you know, many nuts on your tree. And in 10 years, we may have a little bit longer growing season. When I was a kid, they always said if you was growing a peach tree, about half the year, you would be able to get a peach crop every other year. Now, you can get peaches fairly consistent every year because you don't have as many late frosts as you used to. So in another 10 years, we're going to be poised even better. Now, just because you can grow a pecan here doesn't mean you can grow the giant ones that they grow in Louisiana or Texas that take a growing season 300 days long. But we can still grow a decent-sized pecan in Ohio. Now I do want to go back to this for a minute. 
And you can see there's isolated spots. I mean, there's a spot in West Texas where they get 10 inches of rain a year, but they've still got pecans growing. I don't know if it's just a river there or internal ground or other earth they can get. You can see how the range was bigger and then contracted because climate has changed over time. Now, Georgia is a big pecan producing area, but they don't grow their wild. The interesting thing about the northern range, if you look at a map of where the glaciers came down to, the glaciers stopped just above <coughs> that range. So I don't know if the glaciers was what stopped it, if they was growing up against the glaciers. Because it was wetter back then, the climate was different. Now last fall, the high nut growers had our fall meeting at Marvin Bendela's farm in Ottawa, Ohio. It's up by Findlay. In 1968, he planted five pecan trees. Four of them died. This tree stayed alive, and it still produces nuts. He said if we get an early frost, he doesn't always get nuts off of it. But he still gets consistent nuts most years off of that tree. And that shows they will grow here in Ohio. Right here is some pecans that was grown last year by Bob Staley down at his farm by Ashland. So if you're going to grow pecans, part of it is selecting a good site. And you'll always hear you want to have good drainage. And people will say, oh, I've got a slope. You know, the water runs off, so I have good drainage. What that really refers to for good drainage is we want to look at how the water moves through the soil. And when I was in school, we would dig a trench with a backhoe and look at the different, you know, soil horizons, look at the structure, see if there was modeling, you know, drainage. There's a real simple way to tell if you have good drainage or not. Dig a hole about three foot deep, and then call it a day. The next day, come out and look in the hole. If it's dry, you've got good drainage. If it's full of water, you don't want to grow a tree there. You will, you know, pecans like a pH around 6.5, but they will tolerate a wide range. I do recommend getting a soil test done to see if there's nutrients or minerals that you need. I'm sure soil and water can help you get that done. When you put it in, tell them you're growing fruit trees because they're not going to have a section for growing pecans. And it will give you recommendations on the fertilizer to use. One thing to keep in mind, pecans really love zinc. And so your recommendation from when, on your soil analysis isn't going to say anything about growing zinc or adding zinc. If you just put the zinc on the soil, trees have a real hard time absorbing it unless your pH is below five and a half. The other way is to mix it up in water with a little fruit tree sprayer and just spray it on the leaves that you can reach and it will absorb through the leaves and get into the tree. You don't have to soak to the top of the tree with a big sprayer. You can do it with a little hand sprayer. Now, two years ago, I planted 40 pecan trees. Well, I had my helpers do a lot of it. But I've got a half acre of blackberries, but we put in pecan trees and planted them. And then a year later, last year, that's after they got planted. And put cages on them to keep the deer off of them. I sprayed it down with Roundup, covered each tree with plastic bags, and put weed control fabric down because I'm going to plant strawberries in the rows there. And otherwise, I'm just mowing the grass there. And the kids that helped me said, oh, they wanted more work. So I'm doing that. You don't have to grow strawberries. But that's an easy way to, you know, utilize the ground that you wouldn't be utilizing otherwise. 
it's done. Now, if you plant the seedlings that you get, the nut size can vary quite a bit. Now these are all native pecans that I gathered in Ohio last year. Now how many of you people would be happy if you had nuts that size? You know, the big ones you might like, but the little ones, the squirrels are going to be throwing them back at you. They're not going to like them very much. <clears throat> but I've got a bag, those are native pecans you can pass around and look at to see the size variation that we have. If you want a more consistent size nut, you'll want to graft a different scion from a different tree onto your rootstock, and it will grow like the parent tree that you grafted. Now something you'll notice, I planted these two years ago. These trees are the same size a year later. When you plant pecan seedlings, they're not going to grow for about three years because they're building roots. <clears throat> and then once they get a real good root structure established, then they will start growing. Wait until the tree is five to ten foot tall. And then pick a height that is easy to work with. If you want to graft it down on the ground, you can. But if you graft it about chest height, it's a lot easier to work with. Just cut it off there. In the spring, then take your knife and just slice down the side of that bark. You'll be doing this in May. Then you'll take a piece of scion from another tree that you want to, you know, grow a new tree of, a different cultivar. You just take your knife and trim out one side like that. And then on the back side, you just make an arch. Make sure you keep that green inner layer. That's the cambium. That's the living part. And then you want to make a little arrowhead point on the end of it so you can slip it in easier. And then you just push it right down in. Now, you are going to have air gaps. It's not going to seal perfectly. So if you take a little hand stapler, just staple the bark tight against it. And that will heal it, seal it up good enough. Then you'll want to wrap it with the grafting tape. And then put some aluminum foil over it to help keep the sunlight from it, because the sunlight, well, the UV rays, will harm the graft as it's callousing. The top part that you cut off of the tree, trim the branches off, then use some electrical tape and tape it to the other tree, because otherwise you're going to have birds try to land on that scion. And it's still real weak, and it will break when the bird <clears throat> lands. If you give them a bird perch, They'll land on that and won't hurt the scion while it's healing and growing. Also, put a deer cage on it. Deer like to eat leaves on little trees. And in the fall, bucks will rub the daylights out of it and they can tear a tree up. You can get a cage if you want, or you can get tree tubes that cover the trunk to help protect it. Now that tree has a big root system already developed, so when you graft onto it, the graft will start growing, but it will start putting new stock shoots up off of your stock, the root stock. You're going to want to cut those off because you don't want the tiny nuts off that tree, you know, growing up. You want the big nuts off the scion wood. Plus, it will rob energy that you want the tree to put into that scion wood. And it will get callous and bond together like that. This is a cross section of how that graft union works. This was your root stock. And there are the staples where it held on. And you can see how it grew together in the scion.
Now once it starts growing, it's going to be throwing branches everywhere. You want to try to prune that back a little bit. Try to keep one central leader, just one stalk growing up, and don't let it have any branches coming out for two feet below that. Any branches coming off the side, don't let them grow more than two feet out in a year. So the first year let it be two foot, the second year it can be four foot wide. Now, you may see it start to develop what they call stalked buds. That was a, where a leaf was below, and there's a second bud below it. When you see these stalked buds, pull them off, clip them off, get rid of them. When it grows, you can see it's not a very good notch. It's a real sharp angle. And here's another example of them cutting. If you get rid of those stalk buds, the other, the secondary bud will grow, and it will grow a nice branch. This is what you want, a nice branch collar. This is from a stalk bud growing out. You can see how it's a harsh angle, and it's not a real good joint. Now what happens if you leave those? You can see it's a real sharp V angle that's from a stock bud, and it breaks really easy. Sooner or later, you're going to have a windstorm, and you're going to have a limb come out. It's a lot easier to take care of it, nip it in the bud, rather than letting it become a big problem. When you take branches off, don't just try to make one cut to take it off all at once because if you cut down you'll get to about here and the weight of that branch pulling down will break what's left of the wood and that bark will just peel a strip right down the side and tear out. If you just come in from the bottom make a first little relief cut come in from the top it will break right there and then you've got a short stub that's left and you can just take that off in one cut real easy. If you've got the narrow crotch, you do the final cut there. It's a good example. When you cut, don't cut in to that branch collar. That's the growing part that will end up healing over it. Cut right past it, and then it can heal that wound a lot easier. Now, pecan trees will need pollinated. And these are catkins. These are the male parts that produce pollen for the pecan flowers. Now there is type 1 pecan trees, which is called protandrous. They produce catkins producing pollen before the flowers open. There's type 2, which is protigenous, which the flowers open and are receptive to pollen before the catkins on the same tree produce pollen. So you will need a tree of each type so that they can cross-pollinate. However, they will, regular hickory trees, can pollinate a pecan. And if you plant that nut, it is a pecan, what they call a pecan, which is a hickory pecan cross. These are what the little flowers on a pecan tree when they're just starting to come out. And these are the flowers in bloom. They're not very big. Now there are pests that will bother your pecans. Now it's one of those things, if they taste good to you, they taste good to everything. Pecan weevils are one of the bigger issues you will run into. These aren't a very big bug. Here's compared to a penny, how big one of them is. You won't see the weevil itself. What will happen is the nut will fall off the tree and then a little worm will climb out to its way out. <laughs> the
this is where the weevil had been chewing in through the outer shuck on the pecan. And that's what you have to worry about. That's the little grub that chews his way out. From what I've seen, the weevils hit hickory trees and hecons a lot worse than they do pecans, but you will see them in pecans. And it is possible to spray for them or run chickens underneath because that little grub will fall down on the ground to burrow and pupate. If you've got chickens, they'll eat it up before it gets a chance to pupate. That's a natural way of controlling it. <laughs> Stink bugs. They like pecans too. And that's what they do to pecans. They will bite in and it causes a little black spot in the pecan kernel. If you eat that black spot, it is extremely bitter. If you break that little chunk out, the rest of the kernel tastes good. It's just where they chewed in that is damaged. This is different degrees of stink bug damage on pecans. You will see other bugs in your pecan trees. Does anybody know what that is? That's a praying mantis egg mass. So that's something you want to see, you'd like to keep around. Those are the American ones. Has anybody ever seen a bug like that? Wheel bug. That's a wheel bug, correct. You see these lumps on that shield behind his head? It's supposed to look like cogs in a wheel, is how it got its name. This is a beneficial insect. He likes to eat other little bugs. And that's his eggs, what they look like. So if you find an egg mass that looks like that, leave it alone, because those are good ones. Deer will do a number on a tree if you get a chance in the fall. This was just a random tree in my fence row. If you notice, it started putting up other sprouts trying to stay alive because the buck completely killed the main tree. If you don't put a cage or a tree tube on your trees, bucks will find them. When their velvet starts to fall off and their racks are itching, young seedling trees are the perfect size to rub on. And you will be crying if the deer do that one of your prized trees. <clears throat> Crows also like pecans, especially if they have real thin shells. And the crows will normally pick the nuts apart like that. Anybody know what that is? Squirrel <laughs> down. Squirrels are cute. <laughs> One squirrel can gather 400 pounds of pecans in a year. So if you have very many squirrels, they may be cute, but if you want pecans, you may have to address your squirrel issue. Now, I am not a lawyer. I'll throw this disclaimer in. You know, I don't play a lawyer on TV either. This is presented for informational and educational purposes, not legal advice. But the Ohio Administrative Code provides rules for how the laws are supposed to be put out. And they do have a section on nuisance wild animal control. And I'm going to read you the first sentence. It is lawful for any person to trap or take live nuisance wild animals you are allowed to take care of the squirrels. You just have to relocate them. A long, long way. <laughs> if the squirrel is injured in any way, you are required to euthanize it. Any nuisance wild animal that you trap, if it's injured in any way, you are required by law to kill it. Dinner time. Yeah. <laughs> If you want to release 
if you live trap animals that are alive and you want to release them, take the, you have to take them out of city limits and take them far away. They're going to come back. You're better off just to uh, get rid of them. What's your address? <laughs> <laughs> now, there are laws on how you go about trapping animals. Like Ron mentioned, your address, you are required to put a tag on your trap that is a waterproof tag that says your name, address, contact information. If you take an aluminum pop can and a ballpoint pen, you can write on it, and that gives an impression on there to put your name and address, an easy way to put a tag on. This live trap size is good for squirrels. Bigger ones are good for coons. If you end up catching somebody's cat in a live trap, because coons love cat food as bait, but so do stray cats, there's an easy way to tell if the cat that you caught is somebody's pet or if it's a wild, feral cat. Well, I was almost trying to tear you apart. <laughs> when you walk up to the cage, Ruby is right, somebody's pet looks at you and meows and says, why am I in here? <laughs> if you get a stray cat, it's like a rubber bouncing ball going crazy in that cage. It will be spitting and hissing and... Swiping. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's one of those that uh, it needs to be injured uh, and take care of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, you just have to be really careful with the, the yeah. live traps because I was helping my mom when my dad passed. She was having a groundhog and squirrel problem. So I put out my brother's live traps, went out the day of the funeral, out back, and smelled skunk. Oh. We caught the skunk, not the squirrels. Not the ground homes, the skunk. There is, in Ross County, there's a company you call and they'll come out for 20 bucks and they'll remove it for you if you've already trapped it. 50 bucks if you haven't trapped it, they'll come out and set the traps out and get them. That's skunk. I watched them and recorded them removing it. It never sprayed because they put their trap against my trap covered it with a heavy horse blanket and then lifted and it went from my trap to their trap and they just picked up the horse blanket and all and left with it. Never spray. Which shocked me because I was waiting on the stench. They're very docile. They don't, you have to really get them excited for them to spray. It wasn't happy about being in the cage, let me tell you. Another trick with skunks, they're normally nocturnal. So they like to sleep during the day. So when you go out to check your cage or your trap, and you see the skunk there, he's probably curled up sleeping. And you can walk right up, shoot it. And you will have a little smell, but you don't have to worry about him spraying you. Now, when I was a kid, I would trap muskrats and coons and get Fur Fish Game magazine. Mm -hmm. And back then, there was a company that sold a 20-foot telescoping pole with a hypodermic needle on the end of it. And you could poke the skunk and it would kill the skunk. Because then you take another needle and you remove the skunk musk from the glands on the back of it and that was worth more than the skunk pelt was. That was like 20 bucks back then. And believe it or not, it's you women that love that skunk musk. You're the buyers. Ruby's looking at me kind of funny. Well, that's if you buy cologne and perfume. Because they use it in perfume. Skunk musk is very good at carrying odors. So if you have a perfume that is real faint, if you put just a tiny little bit of skunk musk in with it, it makes the perfume smell a lot better. It makes it more smell. robust. But there's not enough of the skunk musk to smell it. Now, if you have these little friends and you want rid of them, it is possible to trap them. <coughs> is everybody familiar with the 110 conibear? Yes, yeah. The 110s aren't. They, oh, those aren't bad. The bigger ones are. Uh, <laughs> I have 
that's the bigger ones that work for the groundhogs. Groundhogs, yeah. That's the Down size the orchard. for a squirrel. You stick a pecan on there, the squirrel will try to get in there. Take a board that's got four roofing nails and mount it to a tree. And you want them just wide enough so that the trap will fit on each side and it won't fall over. And that's what you want to end up with. Supper. That's a lot easier than sitting out there with a 22 waiting to try to shoot him when he finally appears. Don't you have to check those every 24 hours? You are required to check your by traps law. every 24 hours by law. So when you check the rules, you'll want to see that. Uh, you're supposed to put a, ha a tag on your trap with your name and address. I know a lot of people that use live traps. I've never seen a tag on them. Never heard of anybody getting cited for it. But you are supposed to have a. Uh, you're supposed to check them 24 hours every 24 hours. <coughs> Your mouse traps in your house, I think, are exempt from checking every 24 hours because mice fall under the nuisance guidelines. And the sad thing is that squirrels are rodents. They should fall, fall under that as well. But it lists mice specifically as being exempt from that time. But yeah, they are rodents. Mm -hmm. Now, you're allowed to trap them on your own property. If you want to go help your neighbor and he pays you to do it, you're required to have a commercial license for about a year. Another one of the diseases that you'll run into is something called scab. It's a fungal issue. You have some pecans as they're growing that have very little scab to heavy scab problems and you notice the nuts are very small on that. Now some varieties are completely resistant to scab and others get scab real easy. So if you're going to graft a variety, try to pick a variety that's resistant to scab, make your life easier, unless you want to go out there and have to spray fungicide trying to keep that under control. Here's some more examples of how little scab will infest the nuts. Normally, when they get by that age stage, when the nut, you would, the other nuts are ripe, this shock never opens. It's what they call a stick tight. The nut inside is junk. It never developed. These are pecans growing in Ohio that I took pictures of last year. Nice. In October, this outer shuck will start splitting, and eventually the nut will fall out or a squirrel will get it first. As it's progressing, now sometimes you will see where the squirrel or coon has been in the tree, and it will end up knocking these down as it was collecting the nuts, and you'll find them on the ground, that's just the, the soft, fleshy shuck. But other ones will stay in the tree after the frost. It kills all the leaves, but they're still up there. A hundred years ago, they pruned trees a little bit differently. They wanted a tree that was sprawling out close to the ground so they could climb it, and they would take a long pole and they would just flail and beat on the limbs to make the pecans drop on their own. Now we like a tree that's more upright and pretty looking. And the commercial operations use a shaker that's mounted on a tractor that shakes the whole tree and the nuts will grow. When it's time to harvest them, if you want, you can crawl around on your hands and knees and pick up pecans. Or you can go to Rural King and they make a little pecan harvester. It's $10.99. You just jab it onto the pecan and it slips through the springs. When this little bucket gets full, you take it to a five gallon bucket and these little hooks on the side, just stick it in and it will dump out the nuts you've harvested.
If you want a little bit bigger model, this is a nut weasel or nut gatherer. Uh, the nut weasel, you want the medium size. There's also a nut wizard. They're all about the same. They've got a spring-loaded basket. You just roll it over the ground and it will pick up the pecans. Put them in your bucket. This is about $40 at your hardware stores. You don't have to put any pressure when you're we're all on the ground. Very little. Yeah. Very little. Because I'm new to this. You got one of these for our walnuts. It's the bigger one. Yeah. 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 You pretty much just roll it. Yeah. If you put some pressure on them, it skews the things they The springs are fairly flexible. Okay. You have to take it apart then and straighten it back out. If you want to go to the next size, this has a ton of little rubber fingers. This is called a bag of nut. And you roll it over the ground, and the pecans stick in these little fingers, and they get there's a cone there that knocks them off, and they run into that bucket. You need very short grass and perfectly smooth ground for this to work. It will work, but if you have the right conditions. These are about 400 bucks, so you're going to need quite a few to make it work well. You don't have one of those to show? No, uh, Bob has one. <laughs> He's got them hanging on his wall. Yes, he does. When it comes time to process them, does, has everybody familiar with these old nutcrackers? Yeah. You can like get them, you know, yeah, eBay. Everybody's got the old nutcracker and pick set. Marvin Bendelo, where we had our meeting last fall, he's got 50 pecan trees now. He bought a little hand crank nutcracker. These are about 100 bucks to do the pecans. The commercial ones are about $4,000. They go up from there. Now, if you're going to graft on your trees for a different pecan variety, Hickory varieties and pecan varieties are also graft compatible. You can use the pecan rootstock to grow the hickory trees. And these, this is a Fayette Shellbar <coughs> hickory to give you an idea of the size of some of the nuts that you can grow at Granger Hickory. That's a Burlington hickon. Now the interesting thing is, even though it's a cross between a pecan and a hickory, it's bigger than both the parents. The McAllister hickon is also another very large hickory pecan cross. That's for the Fayette. Now, for resources, I can't recommend Northern Pecan's blog spot enough. Bill Reed is in Kansas. He worked for 30 years at the Pecan Research Station for the Kansas State University and he has a wealth of information on his website. The Ohio Nut Growers is our group organization for the state of Ohio. The Northern Nut Growers is more the national organization. They also have a ton of information. If you're interested in looking up the law on trapping the wild animals, the nuisance animals, that's the Ohio Administrative Code Rule that. So, is there any questions? <laughs>